Oxford Community Church. Happy Sunday to you. Why don't, wherever you are, why don't you just stand with us and let's worship together this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what the Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. Even in the midst of it all, he has done great things. Can we help us sing that together?
give you praise. Thank you. Give you both shout it out to the worship of our Lord. Come on, clap with us this morning.
encourage you right where you are this morning in your living room. Come on. We're going to just put on <laughs> the garment of praise this morning. Amen. We're going to put on the garment of praise this morning. Come on. So I just encourage you, activate the worship on the inside of you. Activate the dance. Just begin to dance right in your home. Come on. Activate the sound, the movement on the inside of you. Take this moment and just grab somebody and say, we're going to press in. We're going to take this moment and we're going to press in Jesus. Come on. The Bible says he sent Judah first this morning. Robos. Good morning, Ashford. I heard the Lord say, if you're alive in this day, you're alive for a reason. There is, this is such a time. It's, there's no other time that we've ever lived like this. And the Lord said, if you're here, it's not time to become captive. It's not time to become captive to something because it's the easy way. It's the time to be free of captivity and to not fear, not fear. Don't let fear take you captive. Grab hold of him and trust him is what he says. A little louder, a little louder. Come on, can you say it one more time?
declare that this morning. Come on. tell you, as I hear the resounding, reoccurring theme of that song, the firm foundation. I don't know if we all recognize that Jesus Christ was the lamb slain before even the foundations of the world. The foundation of our resurrected life was in the mind and heart and will of God even before the world was framed. It is indeed a firm foundation, one in which we can absolutely have complete confidence upon. I'm going to ask the team, if they don't mind, to go through that chorus once again and for you to join with them and just consider, just have a moment of meditation in your own heart about this incredible foundation of which you can have absolute confidence and assurance that the life that you are living, the life of Jesus Christ who lives within you, which is the hope of all glory, is absolutely certain, absolutely sure. You can have that confidence in him come on team let's release that once again if we can
not be shaken. Though deep darkness covers the earth, we have put our absolute confidence in you, our trust in you. We believe you. I thank you right now, Father, that the anointing of your spirit is hovering over many rooms, many living rooms or bedrooms, dining rooms. But your spirit, God, is moving. There is an absolute awareness of your presence. God, we know that the Holy Spirit that is here is there. We know the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith is alive and working and quickening our hearts to hear the word. Father, I pray your blessing and your grace upon each and every one this morning. Lord, that they would walk in the absolute confidence. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine a foretaste of glory divine. Amen. Team, I want to thank you so much this morning for this incredible moment before the presence of God. Thank you. Thank you. As they are finding their place here, I just want to speak to you for a moment or two before we go into the Word. We'll be starting today in the book of Hebrews. But I want to speak to you about uh, the days that are ahead. There is still some uncertainty as to how uh, we are going to be moving back into regathering together uh, here at Ashford Community Church in Kingdom City. But we know that you need to stay tuned. Uh, to your emails and text messages because we will be communicating with you this week to let you know exactly how uh, that uh, comeback is going to be. I'm so grateful that we can have confidence, and I'll speak somewhat to that in the message even this morning, that not only shall we return, but he will return. The author and finisher of our faith, we sang about King Jesus, and surely enough, we need to know him as king. But you know, there are so many dimensions of God's presence. We've just come through the Easter season, and many, many of the faith, they still worship the bloody Savior. And some of us have moved to a place to where we also worship the risen Lord. But I want you to know there is a soon coming king of glory. <laughs> One who's going to be wearing a crown. And he, he's going to come and set all things right, friends. What we've been going through through the last number of weeks and months is but a little bump in the road compared to what we know will be coming someday before he returns. And those of us that are as the sons of Issachar are going to know the times and the seasons in which we are living. And we're going to set our heart not to fail, not to falter, but we're going to set our heart on the one who has captured us, the one who has saved us, the one who has redeemed us from the curse of the law and from death hell, and the grave. And it's that one that we want to rejoice in. So as I said, I want you to stay tuned, be sure, and be watching Facebook and Twitter and, you know, uh, emails, and get instructions as we come back together. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, let's go right into the Word this morning. And uh, I want to begin in Hebrews, and I'm going to start by dealing with a subject that Tina and I opened up actually this last Wednesday evening. We didn't necessarily think we were going to be going that direction, but yet as we were moving in our conversation, the Lord began to direct us more and more towards these verses of Scripture in Hebrews that talk about, of all things, entering 
God's rest. That's right. God has a rest prepared for us that he desires for us to enter into. But it's not a rest like a passivity or taking a nap. Though I've been doing more of those lately than I ought to. I imagine some of you have too. (laughs) Nevertheless, God wants us to enter into what I would consider to be a truly supernatural rest. Something that he's prepared for us. So let's jump in to Hebrews chapter 3 and let's listen to what the Holy Spirit says. He says here in verse 7, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion, in the day of trial, in the wilderness. Isn't that interesting? It's interesting that the Lord is going back and prompting once again Psalm 95 that David wrote. And he's reminding the children of Israel. He's reminded of them, and he's speaking to the new church. And he's saying to the new church, the church that Jesus started, the church of the book of Acts, he's speaking to them and he's saying, look, guys, don't follow the same suit that they did that whenever the wilderness time came, they began to harden their hearts. You see, it's easy for that to take place whenever we're listening to voices that are outside the voice of God. When we are being influenced by elements and by people and by situations and circumstances that are bearing against the very truth of God's word. But he told the children of Israel and he told the new believers, he said, don't follow suit. In fact, I'm going to go over to Psalms 95 and I want to go to the original text that is being quoted by the author of Hebrews. And I'd like to read it in its entirety. I know that'll take a moment or two, but I think it's valuable for us in laying, as we said, the foundation of this supernatural rest. And I just want to say right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that the anointing of the Holy Spirit begins to quicken each and every one that's listening today, and Lord, that they would come under the canopy of truth They would come under that fire of your presence, God, into the reality of your rest that you have procured for them, that you have destined for them. Psalms 95, it says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. That's a reference again to the foundation. Come, let us before, come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms, for the Lord is great. And the great king above all gods, in his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. Oh, this is so powerful, so powerful. The sea is his, and he made it. His hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord God, our maker, for he is God. And we are his people, the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Do you hear all these references? The same references that Jesus spoke to and brought up when he was leading his disciples in those early days before crucifixion. He said he was the door. He said he was the gate. He said he was the way, the truth, and the life. And he said he was the good shepherd to lead the sheep. These references are deeply embedded in the old covenant. Today, if you will hear his voice, Friends, I want you to know, I truly believe that today, if you will hear the voice of God, not just my voice, I'm but a messenger, but we prayed even before this service, as you saw, there's a few of us here today that are here in this, in this service, believing God for supernatural things. We gathered for prayer. There are others that are praying this morning, intercessors. 
And we're praying that God's heart will be connected to your heart and that there would be an awakening that would come inside of you that would bring forth a deep rest, a deep strength for the days that are ahead. And as I look at this verse, it says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. As in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, they tried me, and though they saw my work, for 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. You know the story about the children of Israel. They had the, they had the cloud over them by day. They had the fire over their encampment by night. God provided for them all along the way. Their clothes didn't wear out. They had manna every day. They had miracle after miracle. They had miracle after miracle, miracle after miracle. They had the presence of God with them all the way, and they weren't too many days away and out of Egypt that they began to cry back for normalcy. They began to cry back for the things that were in the past, the things that were behind them. And I want you to know, we shouldn't have a cry right now for normalcy. We should have a cry for for the presence of God to usher in a mighty end time revival for the fullness of God's presence to fall on the earth. That's the hour, that's the moment, that's the voice of God that wants to speak into our hearts. This is that day. Today is the day the Lord is made. And it's a day for us to move into a new thing, to move into a new beginning. Not church as usual. Life certainly won't be as usual. I've seen so many different reports from time to time. I've, I've made very sure that I have weaned myself from most of the negativity that's taking place and all the theories. We've learned that everybody has an agenda. We've learned that everybody has an opinion. We've learned all those things, but I want you to know there's only one voice I want to hear, and I pray there's only one voice you want to hear, and that is the voice of our Master. That is the voice of King Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. As I consider this incredible cry of God's heart, because I want you to hear it, in verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 3, I'm moving from Psalms 95, the reference point. And in verse 12, it says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in you an evil heart, listen, 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 of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, as it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence to the very end. Now I want to take a break for a moment. I want to, I want to look at this. I want to unpack just a little bit of this. I want you to see something here. He says, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief. All of us go through doubts from time to time, but that's not the word here. In fact, there's five different Greek words that have different tenses of, of severity. But as it comes to the idea of unbelief, again, he's speaking to believers. He's speaking to new, the new church in the Hebrews, and he's saying to them, don't allow that to take root in you. Allow the living God to be alive and be speaking, ever speaking. You see, it deals with the very area of trust. 
the songs that we sang. Once again, this, mor- this morning, we did not know what song service was going to be or any of that. Uh, we didn't know how all this was coming together. But I knew as we were even praying earlier today, Holy Ghost, you're on all of this. You desire to give us a message. You desire to speak life to us. You want us to come alive to your presence and to what you're doing on the earth. Because he is. He's doing some amazing things if we have ears to hear the voice of God. We've become partakers of Christ if we hold to that beginning. But this evil heart of unbelief, I want to talk a few moments about belief. I want to draw from a few uh, stories that Jesus walked in just prior to him beginning to make that, that long walk to the cross Just prior to that, as he was training his disciples and as they were walking together, there were a couple of encounters that are recorded in the book of Mark. And I desire to share uh, those with you briefly. The first one is found in Mark chapter 9, around verse 17. And I'm not going to read the entire section, but I'm going to pull a few things out. There was a crowd that answered, teacher, teacher. One in the crowd said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams at the mouth. He gnashes at teeth. He becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast him out, but they could not. And he answered them and said, O faithless generation, how long will I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Let me tell you, there's life right there. Whatever the situation is, bring it to Jesus. Bring it to him. See Jesus. Search for his life of liberty. Look, they brought him to him. And he saw him immediately, the spirit convulsed, fell on the ground, wallowed, foaming at mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And and he said, the father said, from childhood. And how often he's been thrown in the fire and the water to destroy him. And then listen to the father. The father says, but if you can do anything. Friends, I have a little bit of concern at times. It's almost as if we sing that same line to the Lord God. Well, God, if you can do something, if you can do something, please do. Let me say this to you right now. He can do something. He can do all things. And you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, listen to what he said. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Now, it's very interesting what happens next because the scripture then records when Jesus saw the people running together. He didn't even answer the father. He didn't make any comment about his position of, I believe, help now my unbelief, this sort of double-minded thing. He didn't make, but he saw the crowd coming and he saw the opportunity, I believe. It's my understanding. And what happened? When he saw the people running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, said, deaf and dumb spirit, come out of him and enter him no more. I love the authority there. The spirit cried, conversed. People thought he was dead, but Jesus took him, lifted him up, and he arose. And here's the conversation with the disciples afterwards. Why couldn't we cast it out? And he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Now, we could be referring to this kind as the demonic spirit, or it could be 
the fact that there was not that foundation of belief, that absolute confidence of belief, but there was this double-mindedness in concerning the deliverance of that child that he said, hey, it can only happen through prayer and fasting. So what he's saying, he's saying that through prayer, our faith can be bolstered. Through prayer, we can move from this position of unbelief to belief. We can take on that capacity. This very morning, can we believe? Can we believe God for incredible things, for amazing things? And then, in Mark 10, another story, and this one is almost in contrast, and I want you to hear the distinctive difference. Because they came to Jericho in Mark 10, beginning in verse 46. And as they went out of Jericho, the disciples in the great multitude, there was a man, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. He sat by the road begging, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What a contrast. An audacious, an audacious offensive thing that he's in the crowd. In fact, the crowd and the disciples behind him, they say, hush, hush, hush. But look what happens. It's so cool. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they warned him, son of David, have mercy on me. Because as they warned him, the Bible says he cried out all the more. What is our cry today? And look at this. Jesus stood still, commanded him to be called, and they called the blind man, say, and this is what he said to him, be a good cheer. Rise, he's calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, Rabbi, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. I want to submit to you that both of these stories resulted in Jesus bringing forth the request. But one was predicated on absolute confidence assurance, a cry, an audacious, a passionate, a pressing into, God, have mercy on me, bring it forth. And I believe that Jesus, he said, hey, go your way, your faith, what you believe has made you whole. Whose report will you believe? I think that is a resounding thing that we need in our hearts I think we need the clarity in our spirit in these hours. Knowing our sins is forgiven and righteousness in Christ is absolute. But everything about Hebrews is about better. It's about Jesus being a better Moses, about Jesus being a better Joshua, about there being a better way. I mean, you go through page after page and chapter after chapter, and Hebrews is saying, we have it better. I want to declare to you today, we have it better than many of us imagine. We have it better because of whom we have put our trust and confidence in. We have it better, without a doubt. But I want to go back before we conclude today And I want to look at this idea of rest. You might say, John, it seems like you went on this rabbit trail of faith. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, the reason that I believe that God was so (laughs) displeased with the children of Israel of not entering into his rest was because his rest is what declared to the rest of the world, specifically even his Sabbath rest, is what declared to the rest of the world that God was God. All the other gods of the earth were driving gods. They were constantly work, 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 work. But when Jesus came on the scene, he typified what God was saying even under the old covenant when he commanded the children of Israel to enter into the seventh day of the Sabbath rest as he entered into rest, which was just to say, 
You don't need to work today. I've got this. I've got this. Can I declare to you this, this very morning that God the Father says, I've got you. I've got this. This is under my charge in the fact that I desire my church to come forth as this shining gem, as the bride of Christ, radiant and beautiful and powerful. But perhaps we need to adjust, we need to recalibrate our hearts a bit. Over the next number of weeks, I hope to talk about that recalibration. I hope to talk about the things that are in vital for us in order to keep our blessed hope. I want to read you a verse of Scripture that I desire to leave with you today that you ponder on, and then we'll finish up this Hebrews passage. That verse of Scripture is in Titus 2, 11, and it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, are you looking for his coming? Is Maranatha on your lips? Come, Lord Jesus, quickly. Are you in concert with what the Spirit of God is speaking at the end of the book of Revelation where he says the Spirit and the bride say, come, come, Lord Jesus. There's something in the blessed hope that recalibrates us as the body of Christ and the church to walk in the light as he's in the light. And look at this. He who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. You're special, guys. <laughs> I'm thankful. I'm special. You're special. But we're special for the zealousness that comes on us for good works. And speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, and let no one despise you. Believe, believe me, friends, I believe there's something very vital for us to be connected and not disconnected from the truth of the gospel that speaks of the return of Christ. That's why I say what we have just experienced through this pandemic is but a just a little bump in the road compared to what a day that is coming in the future before his return. And God wants to allow this situation to extract from us a new fervency for what it is we believe and a full and absolute embracing of the gospel of Christ so that we can live under the fullness of the destiny by which he has called us that we would not be simply survivors, but we would be those that would thrive in the midst of adversity, in the midst of confusion, in the midst of the storm. We would be the peace speakers because of the rest that we have entered. The word, indeed the gospel was preached to them in verse 2 as well, to us, but the word that they heard did not profit them, speaking of the children of Israel. Why didn't it profit them? It was not mixed with faith with those that heard the word. For we who have believed do enter that rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Wow. He said, I swore in my right, they shall enter my rest. They shall not enter. But he had already prepared it, and they couldn't enter because they didn't believe. I want us to enter into that supernatural rest, the one I prayed about earlier, the one that we prophesied, the one that God is speaking to us about. We shall get deeper into this as time goes. 
For if Joshua in verse 8 said, given him the rest, he would not have afterwards spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. There is something that is remaining, something that is sure, something that is steadfast, the rest of God. We can enter it. For he who has entered into his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. I want to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that today we would not harden our heart, but we would hear your voice and we would walk in the assurance of that which you have done for us. We would know beyond a shadow of any doubt that you, being the author and the finisher of our faith, are faithful to complete what you started in us. Against the day, you are faithful to complete all that you began. And we trust in your word. We trust in your promise. And we say yes and amen. So be it. I will reflect, live in, enjoy, swim in the rest of God.
I'm Kara, and here at Ashford Community Church, we believe that the Lord not only uses worship, prayer, and His Word to grow our faith, but also our tithes and offerings. In the scriptures, the Lord challenges us to trust Him with our area of finances. And He also says that He will do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask, think, or imagine. If you can't be with us today, or even if you are, we have two ways that you can give electronically. One, through our website, and two, through text message. Let's start with the website. Step one, you're going to want to click on your preferred internet browser, whatever that may be, and type in Ashford's web address, www.ashfordhouston.com. Next, once the homepage loads, click the Give button at the top right corner. Scroll down and click the green Give button. A new page will open. Here, you will fill in the amount you would like to give, where you would like to give it to in the church, and the frequency in which you would like to give. Is this a one-time gift or an amount you would like to give on a regular basis? If you would like to continue to give your amount on a regular basis, select regularly. After selecting regularly, two more drop-down menus will appear. Here, you have the option to choose weekly, every other week, monthly, and twice monthly. We want you to have complete control over your giving. So each one of these options allows you to pick what day of the week or days of the month you would like to give. With all of these options, you can even choose when you would like to start your regular giving. Click the continue button, fill in your card or bank account information. And when you're done filling in the information, click start giving. And that's all there is to it. Next, let's go over how you can give through text message. Step one, start by opening a new text conversation. And where you send the text message, type 84321. Then in the text message, type the dollar amount you would like to give. Soon after sending your text message, a reply will pop up. In order to continue with your offering, please click the link provided in the reply. From here, you will first select Ashford Community Church. Then type in your email, first name, and last name. Add your bank account or debit card information. And that's it. These are the two ways you can give electronically at Ashford Community Church. Thanks for watching.